The Immaculate Conception, the dogma of the Church now, has been actually taken as a dogma for many Catholic nations before it was officialized, let me put it that way, at least by the Church standards. Um, and one of those nations obviously was Spain. And the devotion to Our Lady as the Immaculate, not just, you know, field tocos or any other terms, but actually Immaculate was actually very strong, very present already in Spain long before it was declared a dogma of the Church. And as a matter of fact, the Tercios, Tercios was a special unit. We'll talk a little bit more, more about them uh, as we continue with the story. Uh, declare her the patroness of the Tercios. There is during Spanish uh, reign, there had the territories of modern day Flanders or you know, whether it's the lower countries, the Dutch countries. There was a revolt. As you know, the Protestant revolt has already uh, broken and spread. And different theological lines had spread throughout different parts of Northern Europe, Christendom. Well, in this area of uh, the lower countries, Calvinism really took hold. And to understand this context with Calvinists, what we're doing at that time, particularly, they were going through churches and destroying any kind of images or icons. They were iconoclasts, in essence, so most of them. So, uh, Calvinists were instigating this rebellion in Flanders and uh, just, you know, trying to break away from during the reign of King Philip II. It was during the 80 Years' War. Um, and in 1868, if I'm not mistaken with my dates here, in this place in the Netherlands, there was, uh, they had to send the Tercios to kind of quell a rebellion. What were the Tercios? Well, the Tercios, it is believed, uh, we don't know for sure, but the closest theory that we have uh, is named after Tercia, which means three, uh, and it was the name of a Roman legion in what is modern day in Spain. The point is, these Tercios were elite units of combat. Well, the difference, you got to keep in context, back then in, in Europe, warfare was for the elites. You know, the smell of powder was the smell of um, um, just like you get your credentials. It was actually prestigious. Peasantry did not really engage in a lot of war. They were more mercenaries. And uh, the peasantry were basically left to do the sailing, like, you know, the uh, crossing on, uh, across the world, pardon me, like uh, sailing across the world. Uh, so to be a Navy infantry was more of a less status for the naval powers than to be a soldier in the field. Well, also the armies did not really recruit just anybody. Well, Spain turned everything upside down and had this weird novel concept saying, hey, you know what? We're going to make every citizen a potential soldier. How do we do that? We're going to train them. We're going to pay for them. We're not going to spend in luxury like, you know, uniforms because we don't, you know, it's going to cost us a lot of money. But we're going to make sure that they have something that identifies, like a ribbon, something that identifies them. And it was the first time in history, or at least that we know of, that a nation turned its citizens into potential soldiers without making them or, you know, uh, obligating them to go to war or anything like that. It was a complete voluntary action. So that increased incredibly the amount of potential troops that you could have. And that, for us nowadays, it makes sense because, like, yeah, army is voluntary. Back then, it was not so much. And uh, there were a lot of mercenaries. So Spain developed this school um, of thought and military tactics that comes all the way, by the way, from the Visigoths. That was way back. And they said, okay, we, can, we have to make any potential citizen a really good soldier, an elite soldier. We're going to teach him how to fight. And a school uh, of um, fencing was born. And it's called the school of uh, um, Salamanca. I forgot the name right now. Um, this dexterity, destreza, this dexterity school. So this guy from Seville went to Italy because they noticed the Italians were really good at uh, fencing. So he took notes and then he published in these scientific studies with mathematical formula and saying like, okay, for example, this is mind blowing, at least to me, you have two swords. And if you work on an angle, you know, you can work physics to your favor, all those things. So he documented all that. It's called the Dexterity School, Escuela de Destreza, and start applying to any citizens who want to be part of the Tercios. Well, obviously, the Tercios became very skilled at fighting in war, and they were the most feared uh, troops um, in, in Europe for almost 300 years, which is quite a bit of span. I mean, if you put it in context, America right now is the only superpower in the world. We've only been the superpower, you know, for the last, what, 60, 50 years, you know, uh, and, and probably less, to be honest, but more like barely over 40 years 
because once the uh, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, we were the only ones standing. But before that, we kind of share that power. Well, um, Spain became dominant power with elite forces for almost 300 years, and they had territories all across Europe. For more information on that, check our Spanish series with Timothy Flanders. You can see in the files in this uh, YouTube channel. So the Tercios, uh, or the Tercios, or I don't know how to say it, were heading to this part of the Netherlands, and everybody knew they meant business. And one of the characteristics of the Tercios on top of that, even though they were very lethal, very skillful at fighting, they also, instead of, they were not pillaging. That was normal between rival armies that they will cross across, uh, they will go across country and pillage and, and steal and take resources as they went through. So a lot of people were always wary of troops. With the Tercios was the opposite. They will bring business, they will spend money and under strict orders of the monarchies, particularly King Philip and any other kings, they had uh, been forbidden from taking resources away from the local populace. In the opposite, I mean, actually the opposite was for them. Uh, they went and that meant, oh, we can sell, you know, and some of them even traveled with the Tercios wherever they were heading. Uh, and they were all, all they were asking originally was safe passage. It was something... That nowadays for us, you know, makes sense because we have human rights and civilians are not to be touched and all these things. Back then was, you know, not necessarily a common understanding. And that understanding was shaped by the Christian thought, you know, by Thomistic and Salamancan uh, thought that, you know, this is how we ought to live as Christians, even when it comes to combat and fighting. But anyway, so they're heading to uh, the lower countries. And as they were heading there, they find themselves in a very tricky situation, stuck between two river banks, uh, in a church in an area called Empel, uh, Empel, and there was used to be a church there. And they were fighting, and the Dutch were actually having the upper hand. And things progress actually or regress really, really badly and looking for the tercios. So long story short, they were stuck, surrounded, and the Dutch commander offered them, you know you know what, this is your chance to surrender, which there were Calvinists, you know, back then, those uh, commanders. And the Tercios uh, responded uh, bravely with honor, saying, we prefer death, you know, than this, uh, than surrender. We'll talk about surrender once we die. And that was his response. Well, the Dutch says, very well, so, so be it. This was, by the way, uh, let me see if I have the date here correctly, it was in 18... Um, 50, no, no, sorry, 18, 18, 1885. I'm sorry, 1885. So while they were stuck, and I'm going to put a little image here. Maybe you can see it. Let me see. There we go. You see that? That's that's Augusto Ferrer del Mao, by the way, one of those greatest Spanish painters of the modern era. You can appreciate that's commemorating the battle and our Lady of Immaculate Conception. Well, as... The battle progressed, and the Dutch said, very well, so you want to play tough boy? So be it. They started flooding the area, which forced the Tercios to uh, go as to the highest ground possible, which there was a church that was destroyed in that area between the riverbanks and Bell. And as they were preparing to die, it was December the 7th, one of the uh, tercios, one of the soldiers, starts digging the ground. Basically, they were starting digging their own graves. And they found, I don't know if you can see it in that painting. Let me see it over here. There's another image right there. It's a painting, an illustration of Our Lady of Immaculate Conception. The Spanish soldier tells the commander, hey, check this out. You know, and they take it as a sign from God. And they say, okay, we're going to be okay. We don't know how, but somehow. Well, that was December 7th. That night, overnight, winds came, very cold winds from the north, and froze the riverbanks. And now the Dutch and their ships were stuck, and they're trying to run away. The Spanish could not believe that even though it gets cold in that area, it does not get that cold that early in that time of the year. Uh, and they were hard frozen, so the Spanish now have solid ground to do combat. No longer were stuck in muddy waters. That changes the whole game for the Tercios, for a uh, elite unit that is used to ground combat rather than, you know, sea combat. And they, they took it as a sign from God. They walk on foot and fought and overcame against 
all odds. And it's known as the battle. Well, in English, it's known as the Battle of Impel, but the real title it is the Miracle of Impel, because there was no way, no chance that um, will the Spanish can overcome that at all. I mean, that was just impossible. But obviously, like anything, all glory belongs to God. And thanks through God and, and his merciful hand, we can overcome obstacles. That's an important lesson, by the way, for us uh, that we're going to touch later. So they overcome. In fact, I put a link there. We're going to read a little extract from, from the text that was translated. I like one of this is one of my favorite uh, translations, and I put the link to read the full description. Um, it says, located north of the city of Balduk Empel, had a strategic uh, nature for its location. That night, 5,000 men of the third tercio of Zamora were facing their fifth day in the cold, hunger, and rain in Bomber Ward, between Meuse, the south, and Wall to the north rivers. The Dutch rebels had opened the dams, and the area had been flooded, leaving the Spanish surrounded in a desperate situation before the ships of the Dutch commander, Philip uh, Neuenstein, Everything seems to indicate that the defeat of the Spanish was near. Aware of this enormous advantage, the Dutch commander offered his enemies honorable surrender, which will he allow them to save their lives. The field master of the Tercio, Francisco Arias de Bobadilla, Bobadilla, gave him a genuinely Spanish response. Spanish infants prefer death to dishonor. We talk about capitulation after death. That's one of the extracts. Uh, you can read more of the story. I put the link. And then um, this is where it gets really, really interesting. Let me keep reading. There we go. It says, after the, um, uh, after the unexpected uh, victory, the Tercios declared the Immaculate Conception their protector. Later, King Philip uh, IV proclaimed December 8th as feast as a feast to keep all the domains of the Spanish Empire dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. So, and more other details that is pretty cool. The point is uh, of this story is a to show that there was an early devotion already in Spain. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why, if you notice, and Spain and some of the Spanish possessions, particularly like Mexico, one of some, some of the main ones. During these feasts, the priests are allowed to wear blue, which is a reserved color for a lady. Any other priest, uh, and I think there's a couple other countries that have that exception, or regions to be more specific, like somewhere in Germany, uh, and somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in Northern Europe, I'm not exactly sure where specific. I know somewhere in Germany and other places, but uh, that's about it. You know, everybody else has to wear white uh, in theory, and except for the Spanish. Uh, uh, countries, Spanish-speaking countries, because back then it was all one one country. And it's only for that feast also, by the way. It's not just any other Marian feast, but the Feast of the Immaculate. So that devotion was there when it was declared dogma in um, um, thanking Spain for its push to, for the dogma, for, for the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Spain was a huge advocate from early on. That's why the Pope Pius IX gave him and granted that, that privilege of the Spanish societies. So our Lady uh, Immaculate Conception obviously has is a big deal in Spanish society. You might be tempted to think, well, um, that's cool, but we're in America. There's nothing that connects us here in America. Oh, that's where uh, I love to say a lot of people, you're wrong. In America, um, also, Our Lady was proclaimed by the bishops here in this nation as the patroness of America. Specifically, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception was proclaimed patroness of America in 1846. Now, to give us a context, the dogma of Immaculate was uh, promulgated in 1854. It was eight years before uh, the Vatican made it official. Uh, and so America was already ahead of the times, to put it that way. Uh, America's a much younger nation, clearly, so it's not going to be, they're not going to have the cloud in history when it comes to uh, uh, Catholic history, as other nations like France, Spain, England, etc. But um, it's pretty remarkable, actually, because America hasn't, hadn't been, like, probably not too long before it was an independent nation, and there were already the bishops here in Baltimore, uh, pushing and advocating for America to be under the patronage of Our Lady of Immaculate Conception. As a matter of fact, our biggest church in the nation, it is 
dedicated to Our Lady of Immaculate Conception, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, I don't know if you have the privilege to have been there, visited, you know, where Catholic University of America is. It's an amazing, beautiful place. I mean, I put some pictures. I was a while back when I had to, uh, I did a little trip to, to uh, for a press conference when I was doing working at a different radio station in the White House and all that. And I went and I've never been there before, never been to D.C. So I took advantage. It's like, this is pretty neat. I'm not going to lie. The White House is nice, but... I got to go to uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Immaculate. It was mind-blowing. I loved it. I mean, it was like one of the best experiences. And I took a bunch of pictures and videos, and I uploaded them uh, on my Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was there because I don't think it was a Facebook. Anyway, so if you want to check it out, send me a message. If you haven't been there, what a privilege. So America is under the patronage of Our Lady. The Spanish society is obviously under the protection and patronage of Our Lady of Immaculate Conception. This is an important dogma. It's non-negotiable, by the way. As Catholics, we are required to believe. This is in um, a lot of the... Uh, I was surprised, to be honest. In a lot of people who are converting to Catholicism, you know, they have struggles with Marian dogmas or Marian doctrines or the papacy or whatever. Uh, some people are sacraments and all that. I'm surprised. I mean, for me, it was never really a big issue, but I'm surprised where a lot of people is. And I noticed talking to some Protestant friends, they uh, I can't help to to think they have this. I don't know how to explain it. This interesting pattern of thoughts, you know, the way they see Our Lady um, is a little bit. Well, it was a lot of it off. Let me put a little ex example. Maybe we we can make some distinctions. So if you know, like in, in, in Greek mythology, usually, and I'm not an expert in Greek mythology, clearly, but the deities of the gods, whatever it is, commune with humanity in a weird way. In other words, is the gods use humanity. You know, they have uh, 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 relations with it and they, my gods, are you know, born out of it. And it's a weird concept. But at the end of the day, the theme is that um, they, the, the gods of the Greek world need humans and they become like incubators so they just utilize them you know the, the the humans you know they're creatures and it's kind of a messed up we you know because we kind of give the wrong understanding of life well we catholics obviously we don't have that that way of thinking that understanding um and the way uh, catholicism understands it which is you know true faith our lady was not an incubator so when i hear People who have problems with Our Lady being immaculate or not being so special, I'm like, well, I kind of see like the pagan thinking there a little bit, um, you know, to reserve Our Lady just to a mere incubator or mere just like a, a receptacle or something like that. Um, it's just um, incomplete and obviously it does not honor God in a, ironically, it does not really honor the Lord because it makes it reduces our Lord to just like any other Greek mythology character, which is obviously the furthest thing from the truth. Simple as that. So um, this is one of the things to me made more sense. It's the perfect balance between God interacting with humanity without needing it and actually humanity being redeemed to the standard that God or the intention, original intention God had for us. And it's a beautiful, beautiful dogma. At the end, and before we run out, run out of time and say, check out the comments, um, you may wonder, well, that's pretty neat and cool. Why would I care about this dogma? You know, I'm Catholic. That's fine. You know, Hail Mary, without, conceived without sin and all that. But why would I care? How does that affect my life? Just like um, in, in Spain and other occasions that you face unsurmountable challenges and you cling to Our Lady you know, and, and, and use uh, and, and call for her protection and guidance. We are facing something bigger than the Dutch or the Protestants or the Muslims or whoever, you know, we're facing something bigger now, day and age. This is not our fault. This is just where the times we're born in and placed in by divine providence. And we should be thankful for. So what we do is what our ancestors did. We call for a lady for an intercession because the glory is going to be at the end. Uh, for God, and that's what Our Lady is going to ensure, you know, that the glory goes to God. This is exactly what we should be following. We are facing um, in our public schools and public spheres incredible amount of assault, and not just on the faith, that anything that is decent, anything that is righteous, anything that is sane, you know? Um, so 
this is the way we combat it. I, I keep saying that in every interview they give me is when they ask me, how do we fight this globalist order? How do we fight this new world order? How do we fight whatever you want to call it? And I was just with prayer, man, because it, it, the glory is not supposed to go to all you know, the people. It's not, we don't need a leader. We need our lady here. This is, you know, that, the way we're going to overcome all these um, challenges. So this story should serve as an inspiration for us to face whatever we have from the world. Because the other option we have is to run away and say, well, let the world burn and let the, you know, everything go and fall apart. Well, that's not really our calling. You know? We're just, we're Christians. We're supposed to redeem things. We're supposed to be blessing people instead of cursing them. And in order for us to have that strength to bless, and to be salt of the earth and to be light of the world, we definitely need to increase our devotion to Our Lady. We need to be praying our rosaries. We need to obviously be promoting and advocating for the dogmas of the church, particularly the Immaculate Conception dogma. As uh, the Marian prophecy says at the end, actually, I just saw it here. Yeah, let me highlight it very quickly. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. I love that one, by the way. Love it, love it, love it. And that's better. You can bank on that one. We don't know how it's going to play out. All we know is we got to do it. Mm -hmm.